that looks like a view of Air Force One. Flying near launch pad 39A for a special guest to have a special view of the astronauts on the launch pad. President Trump uh, on board making his way to Kennedy Space Center to hopefully view a launch at 4.33 this afternoon. astronaut Leland Melvin, who is here to provide a truly unique perspective on today's events. Maria and Lauren, thanks for having me here. And I am like so excited. I've got rocket fuel going through my veins. And you guys, I was out there 11 years ago on Path 39A on STS-129. And this is really hollowed ground that we have here. And you think about the story legacy of Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, shuttle, and now this new era, SpaceX Crew Dragon. It's an exciting, exciting time. The purpose of today's demonstration mission is to put Crew Dragon through the final operational paces that are necessary to officially certify the vehicle for human spaceflight. Both the SpaceX and NASA teams have put years of development, testing, and training into this effort, and we are now just hours away from seeing Falcon 9, Crew Dragon, and Bob and Doug lift off from the first time from the same launch pad that first sent humans to the moon more than 50 years ago. This is amazing. We're in the suit-up room. I mean, I remember this back in 2009 when I was sitting in Lazy Boys from back in the Apollo era, but they have these really cool new suits and new seats that they're, they're working in here. So Yeah, it's so amazing to see this first live look in the room. There's astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley sitting in those seats, um, being helped by the suit technicians. Uh, this room was first used for the first Apollo mission, Apollo 7, um, that they suited up in there in 1968. And there they are, uh, giving a thumbs up. That looks like Doug giving a thumbs up there. Some, some visitors in the room now. It looks like uh, SpaceX founder Elon Musk uh, to the right of your screen and NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Of course, you see a, a partition there to keep them a safe distance from the crew, but they're in there to say hello, wish them well uh, before they depart the suit-up room. That's really cool to see there, and, and we can't hear what they're saying, but uh, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in there right now. Their, yeah. their families get to come up to the window and obviously get a little closer than oh, everybody wow. else. There's <laughs> Megan and uh, her son, yeah. Oh my gosh. So we are up in the crew training area. This is right where Bob and Doug have been training over the last several months and even years to get ready for this flight. There's a couple of things in the room that we're gonna show you real quick. We're gonna start off with the cockpit simulator. Now, there are four seats inside of Dragon, the way it's configured. The two in the middle are where the commander and the pilot seat. So this is the commander seat. This is where Doug Hurley is for this flight. And this is the pilot seat. This is where Bob Bankin is. Once they're in their suits, they can plug them into the seats. They get communications, breathing air, pressurized gas for the suits themselves. Everything just integrated into Dragon systems. But most importantly, right in front of them, we have this set of three displays. And these are the touchscreen displays that give them access to Dragon. This is their window into their spacecraft. They're able to see all of the different systems. They're able to take control of Dragon. They're able to see where they are over the Earth or in relation to the space station. They're able to see even when thrusters are firing. Or, and if you keep your eye on this little dot, you've been hearing some background noise. We actually have recorded noises of those thrusters that they're able to hear and see in real time while they're training. There's also some hard-coded buttons for some of the more important things, like the pyrotechnics, if they need to cut the main parachute after they land in the water, and of course the launch escape system. So they spend a lot of time in here just getting familiar with Dragon's control systems, but you need a bigger picture. You need to put it all together. And to do that, we can come over here where you just want something a little more higher fidelity, where you have everything from the seats, the displays, the cargo, all of it, 
just to really make sure you're training so by the time you get up to space, it feels like you've almost been there before. And that's where we're going to find Jesse. Oh, hey there. I was just training for my next mission to space. But since you're here, let me show you around. This is our flight simulator, which is basically a one-to-one -one replica of a Crew Dragon vehicle as far as the functionality and the interior. So the astronauts can get suited up, they can practice entering and exiting the vehicle, they can climb into their seats and actually get strapped in. These seats recline back so that they can access these display panels, which are and then they can practice flying the vehicle, manually docking with the space station. They can open and close the hatch. And basically, by the time they, they get to a day like today, they felt like they've already done the mission a hundred times before. Well, I'm going to get back to training. So. Yeah, you know, they, they really hit the ground running. We showed up uh, to our first sims, and it felt like we had done it several times before. And so it's great because we do have a lot to get done. We not only have to learn to fly and to operate the Crew Dragon spacecraft that Bob and Doug are going to do later today, God willing, uh, we also have to be ready to do all of the things that uh, a crew on board the space station does, the spacewalks, the research, the basic upkeep of the space station. And so we also have all that training going on as well. And that's what we've been doing for the past several months together. They have a very cool playlist they had on the way out, right? Yeah, I remember Bob uh, tweeting, what should I listen to on the, on the way out? So here's what they chose. The first is ACDC's Back in Black. Uh, I think he actually tweeted that one, or someone recommended it, which is super cool. Uh, and the reason being, they are back. Uh, then they also listened to the elevator music from the Blues Brothers film. That song, Girl from In Pinema. And <laughs> I believe so, yeah. Got another career. That in and uh, meatball loving, <laughs> uh, but the, sort of symbolizing the fact that they're waiting. And the third song was the Star Spangled Banner, nice. the Army French Horns version, um, mm. for very obvious reasons, that one. Yeah, I gotta set the mood, set the tone, right, Leland? You know all about tone, that. Little, little meatball. Yeah. <laughs> Our mind into making this incredible <laughs> moment happen for, for everybody. You guys have started on schedule. Um, we see them signing, looks like they're signing something in there right now. Yeah, we give them a black Sharpie to sign the white room. It's starting a new tradition. Hmm. Yeah, we didn't do that. That's nice. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a good tradition. Yeah. So right now what the crew, the, the suit technicians are doing is they're strapping the crew's feet into these restraints that the boots sit inside of. They're then going to close those five-point harnesses um, around them. I know, Leland, you talked about some of the, the harnessing that you had in the past with the shuttle. Yeah, I mean, this is such a more sleek design where there's one point to plug in to get cooling, communications, and, and everything. And, I, you know, we had a five-point harness. We, you know, had these hoses and things all over the place. But I think this is a much more streamlined uh, look into the future of space. But this is, a, this is a monumental achievement. It's a Herculean task uh, by the SpaceX team, which we're very grateful for, and also by the NASA team um, that has been working hand in glove with them to get to this point. First off, thank you so much for joining me today. Jessica, I'll start with you. Yeah. Walk me through kind of Dragon's life history and how we got to where we are today. Sure. So Dragon was designed from scratch 12 years ago by SpaceX. It was designed to carry cargo to and from the International Space Station. Um, and what that means is 12 years ago wasn't that long ago. So we got to use state-of-the-art materials, um, state-of-the-art, you know, computer processors. So really, Dragon, to start off with, is already a modern advanced spacecraft. But then there's two other parts of it also that really led to commercial crew. Um, one part of it was that we actually were able to man rate Cargo Dragon um, while it's in the vicinity of the space station and attached to the space station. So that was a huge learning curve for we human rated a spacecraft um, for a portion of the mission and then for crew you just have to obviously expand it for the whole mission um, and then the last part was cargo dragon has been this amazing test bed for commercial crew and what that means is we were able to test out like heat shield materials and parachute materials on cargo dragon before they ever flew on crew dragon and now that the hatch is closed um, 
a lot of the a lot of the work of this team is is done. But I mean, they're they're obviously not finished. They're not ready to leave the white room just yet. You were you were talking to some folks about what's going on in this room now. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, they should be completing the hatch leak check. Uh, that's you sort of pressurize that area between uh, there's two o-rings that are there and uh, we want to pressurize that area see if it holds pressure it's a very very uh, sensitive test very high um, criteria for passing and so once that leak check is shown to be okay and that the capsule or that those o-rings are able to hold pressure uh, what the team will do is they'll go back uh, into that area into that access panel and install what we call the SPEP which this which is the side pressure equalization plug um, once that is plugged you've really closed everything up and when the crew splashes down what they'll actually do is pull that plug to equalize pressure across the hatch so that you don't cause the hatch to buckle due to a pressure or sorry the hatch or the the capsule the weldment any of the vehicle to buckle due to a pressure different differential so they should be adding that plug and then they'll cover up that side hatch access panel with the TPS panel or thermal protection system panel close it up and that'll make sure it stays safe on ascent and you've heard Mike Taylor, the SpaceX launch director, give instructions to the team. We've also just heard the call. The crew access arm retraction is underway. Great view from the camera inside the white room. As we see the arm moving away from the Dragon capsule, one of the major events necessary to get down to T0. The next one coming up will be arming of the escape system on the Dragon capsule. All right, we're getting close. We should hear that call out any second now on the nets. So let's listen in. Propellant load has started. Fantastic. So prop load has started. We've started loading liquid oxygen on stage one and stage two. Um, and yeah, liquid oxygen and RP1, which is our rocket grade kerosene. And Dragon SpaceX, unfortunately, um, we are not going to launch today. You are go for 5.100 launch scrub. 5.100, it was a good effort by the teams, and we understand, and we'll uh, meet you there. 30% on stage one. So mobile. right now, everything's continuing to offload. Cool. Uh, the automatic sequences that uh, we use routinely, both at the launch sites, uh, Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral, even Vandenberg Air Force Base, as well as in our Texas test site for first and second stage, those sequences are running. Propellant is coming off of the vehicle uh, per plan. And uh, we see uh, Bob and Doug uh, up in the uh, Dragon spacecraft, uh, just waiting uh, when we can get up there, open the hatch, and help them egress and come on back down the tower. And you heard it live, that weather update of what we violated. We were just 10 minutes off, unfortunately, but again, today was an instantaneous launch. Um, and as John explained, um, it's due to the orbital mechanics and, and making sure that at the time we launch, it will allow us to get to the space station on time and accurately. Oh, it looks like we're seeing some people start to make their way into the crew access arm now, so we should see them get that Dragon side hatch open in just a few minutes. But as a reminder, we'll be looking at weather around the launch pad and weather downrange in their, uh, their flight path on the way to orbit. And that's always checked just in case they have to do any kind of emergency maneuver and land down in the Atlantic Ocean. We will be making sure that the weather is at acceptable levels all the way until there. So for now, we've offloaded all of the propellant off of Falcon 9. The launch escape system has been disarmed. That crew access arm is back right up next to Dragon, as you can see in that view on the left. Pretty soon we'll see the teams arrive to get the hatch open get Bob and Doug out and they'll make their way back to crew quarters and their quarantine. It is important to note that throughout the entire process of them getting into Dragon, uh, suiting up all of those different steps, they maintain that same quarantine that they've been in since uh, for about two weeks now. And that is specifically for events like today where we have to scrub and just go to another day. So we don't want to we don't want to break that quarantine once we're putting them into that launch vehicle. And that's a standard quarantine that we have for any crew members flying to the International Space Station. Uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic obviously puts a little bit of extra pressure and a little bit of, of an extra spotlight on that. 
uh, but they're following a lot of the same procedures that we have in place just to keep crew members healthy before they go and spend several months in space in an enclosed environment with just a couple. Uh, but there are a lot of folks who are going, why an instantaneous launch window for Falcon 9 and Dragon? Now, typically when we go to the space station, when we do the mission planning, it's an instantaneous window. Uh, there may be enough performance in the rocket to launch uh, somewhere in a five-minute period, but you've got to pick a time in there. But in the case of Falcon 9, once we start propellant load at T-minus 35 minutes, it doesn't matter so much uh, if you can move five or ten minutes left or right because the whole sequence is scripted. We do the flight analysis assuming that the temperatures of the propellants are below a certain amount so that we know how much performance is available to the rocket, how much margin we're going to have. So essentially, if you start the countdown, you know, four hours, eight hours out like we were doing today, and you have uh, a very short window, once you get into propellant loading at T minus 35 minutes, you have to go as soon as you get to zero. We don't have the ability to stop the countdown, wait five minutes. Uh, now all of a sudden the liquid oxygen starts warming up from 340 degrees below zero in the ground system, and that changes how much performance uh, you get carrying into orbit and we don't want to cut into those margins. Now, if we had had something like a four-hour window, which some uh, communication satellites have, we could actually get down to almost zero, hold the count, detank the Falcon 9, wait a while, it takes us about an hour and a half, reload a whole new batch of cold liquid oxygen and fuel from the big storage tank that we've got there at Pad 39A and try to launch again. But in that case, you have to be able to launch, you know, about an hour and a half or so later after you scrub. And in the case of the International Space Station, an hour and a half from now, it's nowhere near where we need to be uh, to Dragon get to orbit with status. the performance of the Falcon 9 and the Dragon. So today, it's a combination. We start the day with uh, a one-second window, yeah, just inform you, uh, it's but been once we get hours, inside of 35 minutes, uh, so it becomes an instantaneous level. window for the Falcon and 9, for awareness, regardless uh, of what the uh, customer may be able to give us. So there's a little explanation for folks who are wondering why we have such a... Just a reminder, everything else on the vehicle and for the mission was looking good today. It was just the weather, um, which, as John Aya said earlier, and Lauren even referred to, to him mentioning this, weather is the one thing that we actually cannot control on our missions. So unfortunately, it did cause us to scrub today, but the, healthy, the, the vehicles are healthy. Bob and Doug were ready. Um, and they should be ready to go again with the next launch, launch attempt on Saturday. Just looking at our data. And you can see now, hatch is coming open. Dragon SpaceX, we are initiating seat rotation. Dragon copies, we're ready. That call out from the Dragon core up to the crew, letting them know that we are sending the commands from the ground to rotate the seats. And you can see astronauts Doug Hurley, Bob Benkin rotating in their seat back to a more comfortable position to get in and out of the capsule. That's right. Always great when we don't have any issues with the capsule or the rocket, which we didn't today. Just had to fight that weather. And we'll be doing the same on Saturday. We are looking at about a 50% probability of violation. That's about where we were today. We did see it was all just a matter of trying to line up correctly and didn't make it today, but we're going to try again on Saturday. Right. And it sounds like we were just about half an hour away from making the launch attempt today with weather, um, with 50% weather chance on Saturday. Hopefully we have a better day at T0 uh, for liftoff. I mean, we just, uh, we're just all sitting here. We watched uh, Bob Benkin just climb out of his seat. Looks like he is out of Crew Dragon now and Doug Hurley following suit, no pun intended. <laughs> There we see Bob uh, in the foreground and Doug climbing out of Crew Dragon in the background. Um, I know there's a lot of disappointment today. The weather got us. 
But I also want to say this was really, it was a great day for NASA. It was a great day for SpaceX. I think our teams worked together um, in a really impressive way, making good decisions all along. Both the and SpaceX looking live and at launch teams complex 39A, that is Crew Dragon in the center of your screen, sitting effort. atop and we are a two-stage Falcon 9 SpaceX Falcon rocket 9 that will produce 1.7 million and pounds of thrust at liftoff. Time we are keeping our finger, fingers crossed that, that the weather cooperates. The moon, uh, it's a 50-50 chance. It looks beautiful ago. right now, this but there may be some thunderstorms rolling in later, so we're keeping a close eye on the weather. Now, if all goes well and the weather cooperates, Crew Dragon and Falcon 9 will lift off from Pad 39A, carrying astronauts Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley. Roughly 12 minutes after liftoff, Dragon will separate from Falcon 9's second stage, enter its activation phase, and begin using its own onboard propulsion system to carry Bob and Doug to their destination, which is the International Space Station. And hey everyone out there, my name is Tahira Allen, and if you are one of the 4.9 million people tuning in on Wednesday, we are so glad to see you here again. If you weren't able to witness the pre-launch activities on Wednesday, you are in luck because I'm here to bring you all the excitement happening on social media around the nation. This is a big day for both NASA and SpaceX, and we are ready for you to be a part of it. We had a lot of people engaged on Wednesday, so we want to see if we can top that energy today. We will be sharing your photos and thoughts live on air during today's broadcast, so don't hold back and show us how you're getting ready for liftoff. You can join the conversation by using the hashtag LaunchAmerica on NASA's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I'll be monitoring that hashtag LaunchAmerica all day to highlight your social media posts throughout the show. Dragon and Falcon 9 together have years of operational experience, or what we refer to as flight heritage. SpaceX has successfully completed 22 flights of Dragon to and from orbit since 2010, and that includes 21 trips to the International Space Station. And to get us where we are today, not only have we conducted thousands of hours of testing, but we've also enhanced and added a number of safety features to Dragon. One of, those most, one of the most important safety features on Crew Dragon is the launch escape system. It's a huge advancement in the safety of human spaceflight, and SpaceX was able to demonstrate the system in two important tests, the first one coming back in 2015 with the pad abort test, which we're watching some video back from right now. And then a little bit more recently, last January of this year, the in-flight abort test. Dragon's launch escape system is outfitted with eight Super Draco engines that are integrated directly into the spacecraft body. This enables Dragon to separate from Falcon 9 and carry astronauts to safety in case of an emergency on the launch pad or all the way up to orbit. What they're doing right now is strapping the crew into the seats to prepare for the two big checkouts that they're doing right now. Uh, they're going to do a comms check, a bi-directional comms check, where they're going to check that the microphones that are inside of the helmets that the crew are wearing, that uh, they can, the suit techs can communicate with them bi-directionally. And they'll also do a leak test, which is a, a pressure test where they pressurize the space suit. No, but they're, they're getting ready. They're, they're focused. They've had breakfast. They've had chances to talk to friends and family and uh, you know it's, it's getting real again and uh, that 50-50 chance you know I'm staying positive on 50 percent chance of going uh, you know seeing the suit techs around them with these futuristic looking flight suits versus the white suits that we've had in the past it's a it's, it's, it's a you know transitioning from that old legacy to this new era in space travel and I think they I think he's now taking pictures of the some of the the crew techs, the, the suit techs, which is fantastic. It's all about bringing the family and the team together, you know, making everyone feel comfortable on flight day mm -hmm. and helping us get to space safely as we always try to do. And obviously this is, you know, this is a very serious mission. I mean, we don't want to make make too much light of it, but Leland, you mentioned Wednesday, and I thought that was a really good point, why it's important to, to be able to joke around and keep things light as you're getting ready to go to the launch pad. Astronaut Doug Hurley, getting into his spacesuit, and he's being helped by one of the suit technicians there. So this is our, our first look in the room. Again, Doug Hurley, he has flown into space. Too. So earlier in the show, we polled users to see which NASA logo you're sporting for today's launch, and the results are in. So it looks like about, um, looks like about 62% of you are wearing the meatball today. And that leaves the worm falling a little bit behind. But hey, now that the worm is in that group of people, I mean, we saw um, 
all those different groups of folks from NASA and SpaceX, uh, from all different walks of life that have come together to make this happen. And that was just a small fraction of them. Look at that shot. That that's is so cool. cool. <laughs> wow. A little thumbs up from, I guess that's from Bob. Yeah, and you know, it took, it took a little bit of uh, creativity to get this shot to happen. Uh, we have a chase vehicle that's on the other side of the road, which is, of course, shut down so we could get a camera in there and follow them out. So we are uh, really thankful to Kennedy Space Center Protective Forces for helping us make that happen um, so we could see Bob and Doug all the way out to the launch pad. My ride out was a little bit different than what they're experiencing in this Tesla because we had a, you know, the Astro van had bench seats on each side and we could look across at each other as we were driving out. And it was, it was, it was, you know, moments where we would tell some jokes and look, but sometimes we would just look at each other and we had such gratitude for having this opportunity to launch into space and to think about all the people that had a hand in helping us get in that vehicle to drive out to the launch pad to get ready for this momentous moment and I think that's probably even though they're sitting you know side by side I think they're probably thinking of the gratitude and the people that have helped them get here so that they can be on the you know the pointy end of the rocket getting a chance <laughs> to go up to uh, up to space it's just a, a momentous moment and they're listening to some tunes too I heard right Lauren yeah yeah they uh, there are at least three songs on their playlist that are, are super interesting the first is ACDC's back in black you know that one <laughs> yeah well who does it <laughs> <laughs> right uh, another one that they're listening to is the elevator music from the Blues Brothers film the girl from Empanima Oh, <laughs> Lila. Okay. Got another career. That's enough. Career That's number enough. three. That's right. <laughs> NFL, astronaut, musician. <laughs> yep. uh, you know, we saw Megan and, um, and Karen there with their sons wishing Doug and Bob well wishes and Godspeed as they head off in these Teslas to mm -hmm. launch pad 39A that launched the Apollo astronauts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, this is just one of those moments where everyone in this country is coming together to wish them well to get them to space safely. It's a really great day. To go up vertical and there it is that uh, that shot really gives you a sense of the scale of the Falcon 9 rocket those Tesla's look teeny teeny tiny <laughs> uh, making their way up there and so as they make their way up to the pad we're gonna throw it over now to Hawthar uh, looks like they've already gotten out of the car and they are walking up uh, to the elevator that will carry them all the way up to the 255 foot level and then they'll have a couple of steps to get up to uh, the level where the crew access arm is I have the ACDC song in my head as I see them walking up. <laughs> you know what I was I was kind of uh, jamming out to on my way in was uh, ZZ Top, Sharp Dressed Man. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know, that might be on my playlist if I went there. But there they are, taking, taking in the sight, um, craning to see the top of the Falcon 9 rocket. It's uh, 230 feet tall if you round up, and then Crew Dragon is another 27 feet from the bottom of the trunk to the top of the nose cone. So, uh, if you're when you're out there in person, it's 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 really hard to describe just how how large it. <laughs> Rocket fuel is still going through my veins. <laughs> And we feel so honored to be able to launch from here. Oh, here they are. That's a really fast elevator. Yeah. <laughs> I know it really zips. That took them up to 255 feet in just a matter of seconds. They were moving their, their fog covers? Uh, it looks like they were just maybe checking something on his, on his boot or leg. And we should hear a call any moment that the crew has arrived at the pad as they make their way up the stairs and they're headed to the crew access arm now.
There's the worm again. Popping. You know it. Meatball. <laughs> Don't worry, there's a meatball on Crew Dragon. <laughs> Those white arrows you see there are essentially illuminating the way for anyone who's up there to find their way to the escape baskets in the event of an emergency that would require them to get far away from the rocket and the pad. I have to talk to someone before you get in the vehicle. It's a beautiful view. Large. This is a live look at two astronauts about to climb right in. If you're just now tuning in, you're watching our coverage of the mission known as Demonstration Mission 2 or Demo 2. Today, SpaceX and NASA are going to be sending people into orbit on a mission to the International Space Station from U.S. soil for the first time since 2011. Bob Mankin and Doug Hurley are the NASA astronauts flying today, and you can see them right there on screen. They are just right next to their ride up to space. And crew ingress at T minus two hours and 35 minutes, which is coming up here shortly. And ingress is how we refer to the crew boarding dragon. Also inside the white room is a movable platform that just gets extended out to the capsule just to make that boarding process much smoother for the crew to climb into dragon. As you might expect, it's also environmentally controlled. You can see kind of a big seal right up against the, the side hatch. And that's just done so dragon can be open while keeping all the dust, dirt, and the Florida humidity out of the capsule, making sure it's pristine for the crew. And so that seal's gonna stay in place until they begin to retract it, get the arm ready to move out of the way, and by that point, the hatch will already be closed. And as they climb into Dragon, they will buckle themselves in and attach their umbilicals to their suits. And as you can see, the suit techs are there to help them get buckled and settled into those seats. And as we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, the suit's primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. So the suits help keep them cool as well as delivers nitrox um, in case there is a suit depressurization. As we go through this, we saw Doug Hurley go in first. He's the commander for this mission. He's closest to your screen. And then Bob Bankin's just next to him. And they're going to get some assistance from these suit techs as they get in. Good afternoon, Mike. Loud and clear. I have you the same, and good afternoon. Stand by for my comp check on Dragon to Ground. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to Ground, comp check. SpaceX Dragon, loud and clear. I have you the same. Back to core. And Dragon SpaceX, this, this concludes our launch configuration comp checks. Report when ready for seat rotation per section two of 4.100. Mm -hmm. And Leland, what's your take on the touchscreen technology? We saw a little bit about that, obviously. This is a very different kind of look um, than what we saw during the space shuttle. We know it's the future. I mean, we had our, our LCD displays and we had lots of buttons to press and you know valves and switches and i think this this new technology will allow us to get through procedures much more fat you know much much faster because we had you know paper flight data file that we we're having to turn to different pages and get to things and i think this will make it much more efficient to go through your malfunctions and your procedures with the touch screens and i think you know having the gloves being able to you know touch the screens and work within the gloves um everything's kind of sleek and efficient you know there's not a lot of wires and things hanging off and their knee boards you can see their knee boards on their left knees and so that's for some extra little notes and things the hatch is closed now there's some commentary uh, we are ready for the post ingress briefing when you are ready to copy and we just heard confirmation on the loops that the hatch is closed so that is a little bit ahead of schedule ready you're right, so much history indeed, and it's just been great to watch it all unfold. I think for me, the most exciting thing is how NASA is not only innovating in what we do, ex you know, exploring the universe, pushing the boundaries, getting knowledge on the space station, bringing it back to Earth for benefits here, but in how we do it. We're innovating in the implementation of the, those goals and of our mission. And what that means is that bringing in the private sector, bringing in a commercial space economy for low Earth orbit means space is going to be more accessible and more innovative. And it's just an awesome new era of history to be able to. 
One of the sayings we have is that on launch day, astronauts are sometimes the most calm people in the room. And I found that to be true on my launch day, too. I think it's kind of this career culmination of everything you've learned, everything you've dreamed of, and you know that it's coming together in that day and that you're going to finally do what you're prepared to do, execute the mission, and it just really brings a sense of calm. Now the team will assess readiness for launch with a final go-no-go no poll at T-minus 45 minutes, and that will be followed by propellant loading starting at T-minus 35 minutes. Now earlier today, Dragon operators also performed a series of checkouts of Dragon's flight systems. The spacecraft is also currently go for launch. Our NASA crew, astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, are currently inside Dragon. The hatch is closed. The SpaceX ground crew has left the tower. The next major event for Dragon is retract to the crew access arm that you can see currently alongside the capsule. That'll happen somewhere between T minus 45 and T minus 40. SpaceX Dragon in six decimal four. Bob and I are go for launch. Copy, go for launch. And next up will be go to GoPo at T minus 45. Dragon copy. All right, the crew is go for launch. So we are inside of one hour, still waiting for the weather update. But I mean, this day, this day is one for the history books. We're returning crewed launches to station from American soil on American rocket. But Leland, you were just talking about uh, the work on station and, and Peggy Whitson was getting ready to tell you something. <laughs> well, so the Columbus Laboratory is stalled out, is about to be attached, and there were 10,000 people waiting. Their job security depended on me installing this thing properly. Right. And Peggy said, Leland, push just a little bit harder on the hand <laughs> controller, and all four ready to latch indicators went green. And I was like, yes, and that was our primary mission objective. But that paled in comparison to what happened next. Peggy invited us over to dinner in the Russian segment, and we had this meal with people from all over the world, Russian, German, French, African-American, Asian-American, this diversity that we talked about earlier, were up there breaking bread at 17,500 miles per hour while listening to Sade's Smooth Operator. <laughs> it blew my mind. It was Smooth yeah. Operator, right? You what know? an appropriate song for this I know. job, too, right? And wow, does she know? She, she knows will. now. Yeah. <laughs> and Dan Tani actually changed the song to from smooth operator to arm operator. Uh -huh. So you I'll see arm later. operator. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This weather is go at this time. Dragon copy, go weather. And there you heard that call out. So far we have good weather. We are go for launch today. This is getting really exciting. I don't know about you, Dan, but my heart is beating pretty fast right now. Yeah, we've <laughs> we've been waiting for those words since Wednesday. <laughs> oh, and yeah. we did we did hear a call to the crew just in case you missed it that they were only tracking one final weather constraint. It was the cumulus cloud rule. They were expecting it to clear up within ten minutes and it's cleared up now. So we are currently go. Uh, currently, the probability Hole is complete. We're go for propellant load. Well, we got an early call out there. And launch from... control clear to retract the access arm on time. Remember that arming access arm retract at T minus 45 minutes. Got an early call from SpaceX launch director Mike Taylor that the pole is go. He also heard the direction T minus 45 minutes to prepare for retract of the crew arm. As we hear more discussion, we'll stop and let you listen in. But right now, weather for liftoff, ground level winds are good, 10 to 15 miles an hour. Well, we're the launch abort auto sequence. Operators also advise launch director whether structural break or fire is imminent or occurring for Dragon manual escape flight rules. A reminder on fire alarm instructions, in the event of a fire alarm, key operators previously briefed will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personal safety is threatened, evacuate the, to the south-facing emergency exit, which leads directly out. Dragon, SpaceX, you are go for Section 7, close visors, and arm launch escape system. We will put Section 7 and work visors coming close. All right, the countdown clock is continuing to tick. My heart is continuing to beat five million beats a second. 
and we are getting so, so close. Uh, Dragon in 7.2, visors are closed, we're arming launch escape system. Copy. And as you just... And as you just heard, the crew is l arming the launch escape system. That is one of the absolute last big milestones uh, prior to liftoff, other than nominal Falcon operation. It's about a 19-hour ride if we launch today on time. So that means Bob and Doug will get on orbit. They'll have a number of burns or those firings of those Draco thrusters that they'll do over Stage two, several... Stage 2, load started hear the locks the liquid oxygen load has now started on stage two we're continuing to load fuel onto the first stage that should finish up in uh, just about six minutes fuel is completely loaded on the second stage that's closed out and we are continuing to load liquid oxygen on both the first and second stage the liquid oxygen load beginning on the second stage uh, just uh, about three and a half minutes ago we are also loading cryogenic helium into the storage vessels on the first and second stage, getting in the last little bits of helium when we keep it uh, cryogenic, cold and liquefied. That gets us, uh, just like we do with liquid oxygen, the maximum amount into the storage volume so that we can get the most performance out of the vehicle. Dragon and SpaceX confirmed displays are configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon displays are configured for launch. Copy. Bob, Doug, on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, it's been a huge honor to help you get ready for today's historic mission. Know that we're with you, have an amazing flight, and enjoy those views of our beautiful planet. Thanks, Jay. Uh, it is absolutely our honor to be part of this uh, huge effort to get uh, the United States back in the launch business. Uh, we'll uh, talk to you for more, but thank you. Copy all. Thanks for those words. We are just four minutes away from liftoff. Again, at this moment, Bob and Doug are really just laser focused on those displays. They have insight directly into Dragon and the Falcon 9. They're able to see where their fuel loading is at, how everything's progressing down with the count. AFTS final setup started. Three and a half minutes from launch. And the strong back is now reclining away from the Falcon 9. And back igniter purges. I'll go bleed. Dragon has transitioned to terminal count and is on internal power. Stage one, locks load, close out. Okay, we're at T minus two minutes, 42 seconds. Stage one, locks load is closed out. Stage two will continue to load for about another half a minute or so. Once we get the completion of stage two locks loading, we have to vent down the line so you'll see another large white cloud coming off of the strong back. That'll be normal. That'll happen Nicole around transitioning to T minus power. one minute and 40 seconds. We're going on internal power now. Just a few seconds away from the stage two locks load being complete. It's been almost nine years since we've been in this position. A lot of work done by thousands of people to get to this point. All our eyes focus on two now. Stage two, lock load is closed out. Propound fills are complete. Dragon is in auto idle. Stage two, lock load complete. All fuel, all oxidizer on Falcon 9. One minute, 34 seconds to go till launch. Ground gas closeouts is starting.
Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon is in countdown. FTS is armed for launch. Under a minute now, the FTS, the flight termination system, has been armed. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. SpaceX Dragon, we're go for launch. Let's light this candle. T minus 30 seconds. Stage one tanks pressing for flight. T minus 15 seconds. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA. Go SpaceX. Godspeed. Bottom dog. America has launched. And so rises a new era of American space flight, and with it the ambitions of a new generation continuing the dream. 20 seconds into flight, stage one propulsion is nominal. T plus 30 seconds into this historic mission. Flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9 and look at them go. Falcon power telemetry nominal. M1D throttle down. We're throttling down to get ready for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. We're in the throttle bucket. Reports say all systems are go. Vehicle is supersonic. We've exceeded Mach 1 on the Falcon 9. M1D throttle up. We're throttling back up to full power as we're through Max-Q. Copy, one Bravo. We heard that one Bravo call out. That's just the second abort zone that they're in. They'll continue to be on this until the first stage has done its job and they switch over to the second. At this point, Bob and Doug pulling about 2.3 Gs, 2.3 times the Earth's gravity, already moving at over 1,500 miles per hour. We've heard the call out for MVAC engine chill. That's getting the MVAC engine ready to light. That'll come at about 2.44 into flight. Right now, everything continuing to look good. Next major event coming up is going to be the triple. We'll have main engine cutoff of the nine first stage engines, stage separation, and then ignition of the second stage engine to continue to carry astronauts into orbit. Coming up in about 20 seconds. M1D throttle down. We heard we're throttling down the Merlin engines on the first stage. And we have Miko. Miko. Two Alpha. Falcon stage separation confirmed. Copy two Alpha. And back ignition. All right, we have stage separation confirmed. The first stage beginning its flight back. The second stage being powered by that single Merlin 1D vacuum engine has ignited and is now carrying off. Bob and Doug into orbit. So they're gonna continue under the power of this second stage. Stage two propulsion is nominal. Which will cut off at Seco or second engine cut off at about eight minutes and 44 seconds into today's flight. So a little over five minutes to go still on this second stage. You heard the call out to Alpha, so they're now in the longest abort zone that carries them all the way from about North Carolina up the eastern seaboard almost to Canada. Things looking good though, getting good call outs, nominal propul pul propulsion on that second stage. Bob and Doug continuing to make their way into orbit. Dragon SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Acquisition of signal in Bermuda. SpaceX Dragon, nominal trajectory. 
All right, here in nominal trajectories, the Dragon pointed in the right direction, continuing to make their flight uphill. Heard acquisition of Signal Bermuda. That's one of the other ground stations that they're using to get telemetry and data back from this spacecraft. Stage two propulsion is still nominal. little over four minutes, 40 seconds into the flight. Bob and Doug flying at more than 5,600 miles Dragon per SpaceX hour. Dragon SpaceX nominal trajectory. Already almost 200 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Nominal trajectory continuing. And while they continue uphill, it looks like we are getting a view of the first stage as well. Yep, on your right screen, you can see that first stage with the grid fins deployed. It's making its way back to attempt to land on our drone ship. Of course, I still love you today. And we're just about a minute, uh, a couple minutes away from the entry burn, and that's where three of the nine Merlin engines do ignite to help slow the vehicle down as it re-enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. And then after the entry burn will be the landing burn, which is just a single engine Dragon, burn. SpaceX nominal trajectory. And you heard nominal starting chills for entry burn. There's that call out. They are still on a nominal trajectory on Dragon, still on second stage. And that's that MVAC engine on second stage on your left screen. Again, on your right screen is that first stage booster coming back towards our drone ship. Of course, I still love you. We're about a minute away from entry burn. Meanwhile, that second stage continuing to power Dragon into orbit. Again, if you're keeping an eye on that timer, that's going to continue to burn until 8 minutes and 44 seconds into flight. So a little over two minutes from now, we'll hear the call out Seco. It'll then be a little stage under, two propulsion a little is still over. good. A little over three minutes until Dragon physically separates from the second stage of the Falcon 9 after the upper Dragon stage gets SpaceX, a chance. Nominal trajectory. Dragon copies, nominal trajectory. Continuing to check in with Bob and Doug as they are on a nominal trajectory. Just about 10 seconds away from that first stage, starting that entry burn on your right screen. We should be able to see that view live. Stage one entry burn startup. And there is that entry burn that beginning. Yeah. This burn lasts about 36 seconds long. Stage two FTS is saved. that entry burn continues. We're just about a minute away from SECO. We'll have a number of events all happen in rapid succession. Uh, it'll Copy be the shutdown. second engine cutoff. Stage one we'll be looking shutdown. for that uh, stage one landing burn shortly after. Actually, just within a few seconds of each other. It's such a cool view on your left screen, seeing Bob and Doug on Dragon. Right now you can see the displays that they are seeing right now themselves. Terminal guidance. And back throttle step. We are coming up 25 seconds or so away from SECO or second engine cutoff. This is also the point where Bob and Doug are experiencing their highest G-force. We're seeing the counter tick up to right about 1.8. Copy Shannon. You heard Shannon, so that just means they're in their final abort zones. If they were to abort at this point, would either be an abort to orbit or to land off the coast of Ireland. Standing by for second one line cutoff startup. confirmation. MVAC throttle step. MVAC shut down. Stage one landing line. Confirmation of Seco's second engine cutoff. 
Now we are waiting for our first stage to make its way to our drone ship. Of course, I still love Dragon you. Dragon SpaceX nominal orbital insertion. Launch confirmation is nominal orbital Dragon insertion. Dragon captain, nominal orbital one insertion. One and what you're seeing on your screen is a live view of our drone ship, where our first stage will be coming down. Looks like we lost that live view, but we'll wait for confirmation of that landing shortly here. Falcon 9 first stage is successfully landed. And there you can see on your screen, Falcon 9 has landed. This is the first Falcon 9 to carry humans to orbit, so very exciting for us. And as you can see on your right screen, Bob and Doug are still making their way to their targeted orbit. Have one to recovery one. So exciting today. <laughs> it doesn't stop. It does not stop. All right, we did we did hear again that call out good orbital insertion, so that means Falcon 9 and Dragon right now exactly where they're supposed to be. Can we need a FRC on recovery one? And it's right at about 12 minutes when Can Dragon will separate. Looks like we saw a zero G indicator floating around there. I know Bob and Doug owe us a little bit about what exactly that is that they brought up with them. <laughs> and before separation, before Dragon initiates separation from the second stage, they do make sure to make, they, they do ensure that the vehicle is not spinning and it is in good con condition before we separate. That's right, the upper stage does small attitude maneuver using some cold gas thrusters built into the rocket body itself. Exactly, so we do expect that separation to occur in about a minute from now, but they do wait until they have full confirmation that it is ready to separate. Such cool views. I cannot get over this view that we are seeing right now. Bob and Doug on the right screen, inside of Crew Dragon, out in space. Yeah, already 200 kilometers over planet Earth, or a little over 124 miles, traveling in excess of 2,700 meters, 27,000 meters per second, or about 16,000 miles per hour. So again, we're just standing by. That separation event should be coming up shortly. Then they'll begin a series of checks on the Draco thrusters that are going to be used to maneuver and then power Dragon on its flight to the International Space Station. Standing by for separation. Expected loss of signal, wallops. It sounds like we had an expected LOS loss of signal with one of the ground stations. Waiting for confirmation now of that. Dragon setup. separation confirmed. Dragon separation and confirmed. <laughs> there is a great view right in front of you Count of Dragon separate. separating. Separation and there's that call out. Dragon is now officially making its way to the International Space Station today. Dragon SpaceX with that separation call. Uh, we have a few words for you from our Falcon 19. Standing by. Dragon, Chief Engineer on Dragon to Ground. Bob Doug, on behalf of the entire launch team, thanks for flying with Falcon 9 today. We hope you enjoyed the ride and wish you a great mission. Thanks, Bala. Congratulations to you and the F9 team for the first uh, human ride for Falcon 9. And it was incredible. Uh, appreciate all the hard work and uh, thanks for the great uh, ride to space. Copy all. Good luck. Proud of you guys and the rest of the team. Uh, thank you so much for what you've uh, done for us today, putting America back into low Earth orbit up from the Florida coast. Copy all. Good luck. Godspeed. All right, so Bob and Doug are in and Dragon space. Dragon SpaceX, we confirm nominal equals activation and service section Draco checkouts. Uh, nose cone deploys in progress. Copy all. We're monitoring. The core here in Hawthorne giving the crew a heads up. 
that we have confirmation the nose cone is deploying. So, again, that nose cone is going to open up a little bit more than 90 degrees, goes up to about, I think, 105 degrees, and that's going to expose uh, the actual docking ring and the hatch that they're going to be going through once they attach to the International Space Station. And also four of those Draco thrusters, we call them the forward bulkhead thrusters, that are going to be used for these major phase burns or firings of those thrusters to actually raise their orbit gradually over the coming hours. Also heard good activation of the ECLIS, that's the Environmental Control and Life Support System. That's everything controlling their atmosphere, uh, just keeping Dragon a nice, safe, habitable environment where they're going to be living for the next 19 hours until they arrive at the space station. Right, exactly. And Falcon 9's job may be done for today, but the mission is not over. Crew Dragon's job is not done. As you can see, Bob and Doug are still inside Crew Dragon making their way. It will be a 19-hour trip to the International Space Station before they dock tomorrow morning. And such cool views. I love that we can get these live views here and see and watch what they're doing now that they are in orbit. Yeah, it's, it's incredible to just be looking over their shoulder to be along for the ride. And we're going to be with them and we're going to be with all of you the entire way uh, for their journey to the space station. We're going to be covering live throughout. Uh, Bob and Doug will obviously have a sleep period uh, where they'll get about eight hours of sleep a little bit later today before they wake up for all of their final approach. Uh, one of the major things we are looking forward to in the next couple of hours is going to be their first turn at the controls. So they're actually going to be using those touchscreen displays to take control and manually pilot Dragon. We'll walk you through what that's going to look like. And assuming we have some good ground station coverage, we'll be able to get views from right inside Dragon, looking over their shoulder as they manipulate the controls at the display. But, I mean, it, we had a, a smooth ride uphill, both stages of the Falcon 9 doing their job, placing Bob and Doug in orbit. I mean, this is, this is a day, this is a historical day. This is us kicking off that new era of space flight that we've all been talking about and longing for since the space shuttle program came to an end in 2011. Yes. And the weather, the weather cooperated. Yes. Second time's a charm. <laughs> right. And we're going to be back here on Sunday, but we we did it, did and it. the room cleared out. Everybody was outside watching, and the and the inside the lights were shaking, the cameras were shaking. Lauren came back in with tears in her eyes. <laughs> in establishing bi-directional communications with the station using a system known as C2V2, which stands for Common Communications for Visiting Vehicles. They also set up a data stream from Dragon to the station, just giving another path for Dragon telemetry or data about its performance to come down to the ground and giving an additional command capability to astronauts on board the station. They'll also maneuver Dragon to the proper attitude and then initialize the navigation sensors used for that very slow and methodical approach to station. At approximately 5.24 a.m. Pacific time, that's tomorrow morning, Draco thrusters on Dragon will fire for the approach initiation burn when Dragon is about two and a half kilometers below station and just about seven kilometers behind it. This will swing Dragon up until it is about 400 meters directly below the station, and this maneuver will also move Dragon inside one of those two safety zones around the station that requires a set of go-no-go -no -go poles with the different control teams. The first zone is called the approach ellipsoid, which is an imaginary shape measuring about four kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers, which is essentially a large three-dimensional oval. Before Dragon is given permission to move inside the ellipsoid, referred to by the teams as the AE, it is configured to be on what is known as a 24-hour safe trajectory. This means that if Dragon lost all control... Dragon, for update. If Dragon lost all control to its thrusters, it would be at least 24 hours before its Go ahead, Dick. trajectory would move inside the approach ellipsoid. Okay. Uh, for suit doffing, we're still waiting for cabin to be below 25C and trending down. Uh, it looks like it's on the way there, but not quite. Um, and the second item is during the burn, we may have uh, intermittent calm and due to pointing, and this is expected. We're just with that, they'll transition control back over to the Dragon flight computer to resume that automated docking. 
and one's dragon is only 20 meters away from waypoint two, that the spacecraft focuses on aligning its docking system with the docking adapter. Dragon will then fly in and make contact with the IDA, giving us what we call a soft capture. The soft capture ring then retracts until sensors indicate it's time for hooks to drive in place to give, to give us a hard capture and firmly secure Dragon to the station. Then it's time for leak checks and hatch opening, which is currently timeline to come about two hours following docking. Yes, American astronauts on an American rocket from American soil showing you what Americans can do when we come together as a team and blast Doug and, and Bob off to the cosmos. This is, this is what it's all about, and their families and everyone is working together to, uh, to take them up to space safely. So um, I don't know what to say. Um, that rocket fuel <laughs> is still in my, in my veins, and uh, I want to go get on the rocket. <laughs> you personally, Jim, as that rocket was lifting off and you felt that rumble? Yeah. Uh, what'd you feel? What'd you experience? Well, I was praying. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I was praying. I was praying for Bob and Doug. I was praying for their families. I was praying for their safe return, even though they're just going. Um, but man, I'll tell you, it was, uh, I've heard that rumble before, but it's a whole different feeling when you've got your own team on that rocket. And, uh, and they are our team. They are America's team. This is Launch America. This is everything that America has to offer in its purest form. And we have confirmation the first burn is in progress. Again, this is the first of the five major maneuvers. This one's called the phase burn. Using those forward bulkhead thrusters, uh, so just those four Dracos at the very top underneath the nose cone to do these what we call delta V maneuvers, so just big changes in velocity that we're going to do to gradually raise this orbit up over the coming hours. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're watching some of the screens. We're able to see the burn is in progress. Uh, it's expected to last for several minutes, so we'll just keep an ear out, make sure that everything goes well, and then we'll get a report uh, pretty much the same time the crew does on how the burn goes. So we're, we're really just looking for those words, good burn, yeah. uh, after it's complete. Like we said, this is the first of five major burns that we that we will be performing over the coming hours. Uh, so this is basically the first step, first major step in the free flight of uh, Demo 2. Astronauts sometimes are referred to as heroes, and no doubt Bob and Doug uh, demonstrated uh, that today. Um, I just got a note moments ago, Doug Hurley announced that the Crew Dragon is named Endeavor. Okay. And cool. we are Thanks. going to look well, good morning, everyone, from uh, Endeavor. We uh, had a great night uh, last night, got to get a little sleep, and uh, as you can see from the video, we are just passing over Saudi Arabia in the Middle East, a uh, beautiful day pass right now, and uh, heading northeast up towards Central Asia, and then we'll work our way out the western western part of uh, the Himalayas there and work our way all the way out over looks like Japan out into the Pacific uh, for this particular pass. If you uh, look closely in the video, you can see just a sliver of moon uh, kind of halfway between the surface of the earth and the uh, window pane uh, as we're flying at about 17,500 miles an hour uh, around the planet. Getting pretty close to ISS. Uh, when we were in the uh, night part of this orbit, we actually got to see ISS out the window, which was pretty neat to see it for the first time on this trip. Bob's panning the camera back now, just kind of taking a look at around the uh, cabin just to see how things look after a uh, crew's lived in Dragon for uh, an evening. We, uh, last night, uh, the way things went, we had our normal uh, activation, got out of our suits, had some, uh, a little bit of dinner, then, uh, reconfigured the cabin for uh, orbit ops, did a couple uh, other events, including the media event last night, and then we uh, proceeded to get ready for bed, which uh, in space takes, takes a little bit longer. 
than I think uh, on planet Earth that we had to pull out sleeping bags and sleeping clothes and all those kinds of things got kind of cleaned up and then uh, we ended up sleeping uh, just like we are right now, right in our chairs, which was actually a pretty comfortable night's sleep. One of the things we did uh, yesterday was actually manually fly Crew Dragon uh, for the first time. And uh, I want to compliment the teams uh, at Hawthorne. Uh, just a spectacular job uh, with the simulator as the vehicle flew exactly like the simulators out in Hawthorne. So just want to thank the teams that did all the work on that uh, particular uh, training device as well as all the modeling and the GNC it really worked out well and uh, was a joy to fly. And I'm guessing it was the first time a space vehicle was flown with a touchscreen before. So we got that going for us. I'm going to hand the uh, mic over to Bob. Board, the Dragon Capsule Endeavor. Uh, Doug and I had a good night's sleep last night. Uh, we were surprised, I think, at how well we actually slept aboard the vehicle. A little bit quieter than uh, than space shuttle, a little bit more, I guess, environmentally controlled. So we had a, uh, didn't have CO2 pockets or things like that building up, giving us uh, congestion, which was uh, super awesome. He talked a little bit about the changing and going back and forth between our suits and our sleepwear and the clothes we're in now and uh, managing all those things. But we've managed to keep the ship uh, pretty tidy at this point as we went through the, the night's activities and then got into uh, our preparation for today. Uh, we did get our suits dried out, get them packed away into the uh, black bags that are stowed in the outboard seats. You can, if you look closely, you can see we've got them strapped it in with the the regular straps that you'd use for uh, riding into uh, orbit, and then over against uh, kind of that that former window location, there is a, uh, you can see Doug's uh, sleep bag there uh, next to his uh, crew notebook, and so that's how we're keeping all of our, our laundry constraints floating all around today. Doug mentioned the uh, manual flying and, and how well the uh, simulator matched that. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, for the ride uphill on Ascent, they just are never able to capture that at the simulator. And so I think uh, Doug and I were uh, talking about all the observations that we had all the way uphill um, while it was uh, an exciting ride. I think we got a, a couple of uh, minor surprises just in terms of the way the vehicle is kind of moving and, and shaking and uh, taking you into orbit, you can tell that it's uh, it's fighting against the Earth as it, uh, it makes it way, its way into space, and that's just something a simulator can never never truly simulate. Uh, we do have a, a friend on board with us. We introduced you to Trimmer yesterday uh, when we did our uh, little activity with the camera. Trimmer also had a good night's sleep. I know that uh, both of our sons are pretty happy about that uh, with their pet dinosaur making it into orbit. and and having a good night uh, in zero gravity. We plan once we get on board the space station to reunite uh, Trimmer with Earthy and plan to bring both of them back to Earth. I know that uh, we'll get Trimmer through the safety brief and get all the education that's required so that uh, uh, we'll have a, a safe operation while we're on board the uh, space station should anything come up that uh, we need to be prepared for. I know that Trimmer's also looking forward to helping us out with uh, EVA preparations uh, just in case we need to do a uh, spacewalk, and so we're uh, looking forward to that as well. Two minutes until LOS. Let's see, I think we'll go ahead and bring the uh, camera out a little bit and we'll show you uh, what's going on underneath the seats on board the Dragon Capsule Endeavor. We've got uh, uh, quite a bit of cargo that we'll be taking to the space station. We've got some hard racks as well. We 
the uh, hard stowage that we have can also be swapped, these uh, hard containers here, for powered cargo, which lets us bring back refrigerated things from the International Space Station. And if you're super lucky, we don't have that this time, but I bet you some crew will take ice cream to the International Space Station with those. Uh, that'll be exciting for those crews to get to have that. We, we do have some uh, emergency equipment uh, labeled in red, which is uh, nice to have and easy to see, as, as well as the other stowage bags that we have uh, down here as well. Uh, I don't know if you were watching closely during our strap-in and uh, insertion on the on the pad, but uh, we did have the seats rotate at, at one point. We were down in a, a easier configuration to ingress the vehicle in, so when we climbed aboard, the seats were rotated down, and after we were strapped in, they rotated up. And our activities, and so those seats uh, will rotate again uh, in preparation for splashdown uh, when we eventually come home. So if any of you all know uh, Uncle uh, Kirk Shireman, as we call him, you could uh, ask him uh, when we're coming home and uh, make sure that uh, he starts having a plan for us. Appreciate you having them uh, coming on board again with us on Endeavor, and enjoyed showing you around both inside and out. Uh, the next time uh, we'll be on video for you, we'll hopefully be on board. Chris Cass, in just hours. So we appreciate you stopping by and from Endeavor. everyone, welcome aboard Dragon. Uh, my name is Doug. Next to me is uh, Bob. You probably know him. We're so glad to be with you uh, this evening and uh, welcome you on board uh, Dragon. Got a couple uh, things we want to talk about first before we kind of show you around. The first is uh, kind of a tradition we've had uh, over the years with spacecrafts going way back to the uh, Mercury era. Uh, and then a tradition that's been carried on ever since with uh, all our space vehicles, including the Soyuz. Uh, we uh, were, were given the honor to name uh, this capsule. I know most of you uh, at SpaceX especially know it as Capsule 206, but uh, I think uh, all of us thought that we could maybe do a little bit better than that. So uh, without further ado, we would like to uh, welcome you aboard Capsule Endeavor. Uh, we chose Endeavor for a few reasons. One, because of this incredible Endeavor, uh, NASA, SpaceX, and the United States has been on uh, since the end of the shuttle program back in 2011. The other reason we named it uh, Endeavor is a little more personal to Bob and I. Uh, we both had our first flights on shuttle Endeavor, and uh, it just meant so much to us to carry on that name. Uh, that's what we decided to go with. So we hope you enjoy that name, and once again, welcome on board. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome aboard Endeavour, the uh, SpaceX vehicle headed to the International Space Station. Uh, today, we accomplished the first flight off the Florida coast in uh, quite some time, and Doug and I were really proud to have an opportunity to be a part of that. Uh, we're doing it in a brand new uh, spaceship, a spaceship that's a lot different than its namesake uh, Endeavour, the space shuttle, and that it has a touch display screens that allow us to accomplish most of the interfacing requirements that we have. We'll have uh, if Doug pans over and points at the display in front of me, you can see the, the forward view that we had uh, uh, during the maneuvers that we most recently did. You can look out the window. It looks like the centerline camera doesn't have a lot of content on it now. We're kind of pointed into space so that the windows can see the Earth below us. But we've got the capability to interface with the vehicle, and it's kind of interesting. There's a command. This little button over here is actually what the commands are for our displays. One thing that does get lost is there is a uh, extensive uh, button panel down below as well. So over on uh, this side, we can turn the displays on and off, as well as send some commands for some contingency situations. Uh, on the other side, we have the ability to uh, deploy 
shoots and things like that on entry. So uh, we do have some buttons, but the primary interface is uh, these displays. So nice, new, modern cockpit that we've got for our, our uh, compared to our namesake, the Space Shuttle uh, Endeavor. I'm going to migrate a little bit away from our seats here, and Doug from his seat is going to continue to try to follow me yeah, so you can tell minute, what Laura. can be Thank seen you. from the, the seat that he sits in. So from his seat, when he is inside the in the vehicle, strapped in, this is what his view actually looks like. You can see a, a window off to the one side. We each have a window that we can view out and, and see what's going on outside. That was exciting on Ascent for us to be able to see the the arm rotate away from the pad, and that's when we both, I think, knew that we were uh, going to launch today. So that was that was super cool. I've got one on my side uh, as well. Uh, the hatch that we came in is the hatch that's uh, right okay, behind Laura, me. We are ready it is a little update. bit. Of a tight quarters, um, but I'm going to uh, try to uh, demonstrate some of the capability that we have now that we're in zero gravity. So I think I was requested to do a backflip. I'm going to kind of do a side spin, which is a little bit of a permutation on that request. Okay. So hopefully you can see what it's like to actually float in zero gravity. And uh, Doug and I are super excited that we got the opportunity to do this again today, uh, even before the end of May. So that was super cool. We did. It, in, it turns out we end up with one stowaway on board our uh, vehicle when we launched today. It was not uh, uh, just Doug and I who uh, accomplished the launch here. We do have uh, an Apatosaurus aboard. We both have two boys uh, who are super interested in dinosaurs. And uh, we collected up all the dinosaurs between the two houses. And Trimmer, the Apatosaurus, uh, got the vote from the boys to make the trip into space today with us, and so that uh, was a super cool thing for us to get a chance to do for both of our sons, who I, I hope are super excited to see uh, their toys floating around with us on board. I'm sure they would rather be here uh, given the opportunity, but hopefully they're proud of this as well. Okay, uh, as we work our way towards one of the windows, uh, unfortunately it's getting a little bit dark, but uh, I don't know if Bob can pan over here. We're now, we just passed off of the coast of Newfoundland and we're headed over to, uh, or over the Atlantic right now. I don't know if you can uh, get a good picture of that. Anyway, um, hopefully you enjoy that view um, as we pass over the Atlantic. And uh, I think with that, we will work ourselves back into the seats and uh, wrap things up for this evening. Doug's there uh, making a nice big smile for the camera. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the trip today with us on board the uh, Dragon Capsule Endeavor with our friend Trimmer, the Apatosaurus, uh, and Doug and I. We just would like to uh, thank SpaceX, we'd like to thank NASA, and we'd like to thank the, uh, the American people for the opportunity today. And we're really proud of the entire team that was able to accomplish human space flight again from the Florida coast. Uh, just a wonderful experience. Uh, Doug and I are just so proud to be a part of it and just uh, want to thank uh, everybody who gave us uh, this opportunity and worked so hard uh, to make this happen today. So with that, uh, I think it'll be good night from Capsule Endeavor. Good night to everyone at NASA, at SpaceX, and the United States, and congratulations to the teams that got us into orbit. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing uh, Chris Cassidy and uh, his Russian colleagues on board the International Space Station uh, tomorrow morning. 
um, the SpaceX team and the NASA team together, working hand in glove, you know, together solve these problems together, right? We, we tackled them and we solved them and figured out how we we're going to go fly together. And, um, but without the SpaceX folks making it happen, like Jim said, so quickly, we wouldn't be here today. I mean, before they had launched, Bob Bankin had referred to this mission as every astronaut's dream, getting to launch in a new spacecraft, putting it through its paces. He and Doug Hurley with those test pilot backgrounds, testing out a new spacecraft has to be as good as it gets. Uh, but they're still stepping through this manual piloting. Uh, we should have just a few more minutes until they're done uh, with this Y-axis translation. Here's a great view from uh, a camera behind Bob and Doug. Bob in the, the right-hand seat and the pilot seat. Doug in the commander seat or the CDR seat. Um, they've got a display in front of them that's the, the forward view. It's got some procedural information on the left-hand side that's telling them criteria that they're looking for. Um, anything off nominal, they could, of course, step in and, and issue a command if necessary. And then on the, uh, the right, left-hand and right-hand screen, we're actually their, their piloting controls. So when when the vehicle is in an appropriate state to receive those commands, they can just hop in and use those uh, touch-sensitive gloves, issue commands to the vehicle's attitude control system. And we are right on the timeline, uh, ready to receive Bob and Doug here at the International Space Station. You're get a look, getting a look from the inside of the space station at the forward end, right where Chris Cassidy is, uh, down that hatchway. That's where Bob and Doug are going to be docking. That's called the pressurized mating adapter. Uh, Chris Cassidy opened the hatch to uh, essentially ventilate that pressurized mating adapter. That hatch normally closed for day-to-day -day operations, but opening it up allows the air from inside the International Space Station to circulate inside and really get rid of some of those CO2 pockets, one of those things you got to worry about when you're in the microgravity environment. But now that the uh, air is circulated in the pressurized mating adapter, we got good ventilation of that segment of the space station. Cassidy's prepping uh, the pressurized mating adapter to close the hatch there. Uh, just don't want anything floating in while uh, we have uh, while we have a good mix. So just an extra precaution before we uh, get towards the docking of Bob and Doug. He's also configuring some cameras. You're getting a view now. That's one view that we'll be able to get from the inside there. There be, should be a few more coming shortly. Uh, and uh, Chris Cassidy has also completed some a rendezvous conference to go over the procedures, everything he has to look forward to for the monitoring of the approach and docking of Bob and Doug here shortly. The International Space Station itself is also being configured for Bob and Doug's arrival. Attitude has been switched to proximity operations, and the solar array joints, the solar alpha rotary joints, are, are being uh, configured to be locked. Uh, this is, again, one of those precautions needed uh, for Bob and Doug's arrival. Everything is on track. We're a little bit less than an hour from bi-directional communications with the C2V2, common communication for visiting vehicle. There's one on the space station also one on Dragon. That bi-directional communication will allow some good solid video, audio, and telemetry data to be exchanged from Dra between Dragon and International Space Station. Uh, Dragon at that time won't need to rely on TDRS satellites and the ground stations. Really everything can be accomplished through that C2V2 link. That's coming up here in uh, just a little bit uh, less than an And we did hear confirmation that the AI burn, the approach initiation burn, is in progress. Again, this is about a 90-second firing of those thrusters on the Dragon spacecraft.
Greg and SpaceX on Big Loop Burn Complete Nominal Burn. Reminder to review your Impulsive Retreat Recovery cue cards if desired. Happy Nominal Burn on the Big Loop. We will review our cue cards. So uh, Anna Min and the core there giving giving the crew some insight that the burn was completed nominally. Uh, as Dan had mentioned, there is that mid-course correction. And uh, Anna had, had mentioned uh, impulsive retreat cue cards. Um, Bob and Doug have the ability to, to issue commands to Dragon if they see anything that's unsafe. So of course on, on those three displays that they have between the two of them, uh, they can see the, the rate of the vehicle, how quickly they're closing, and they have a a set of criteria that they're looking for to make sure that they're safely approaching the station. So uh, Anna just giving them a play used for manual piloting. Please go to audio settings and adjust a gain setting for seat one or four. And in addition on the big loop uh, in, in step two review of steps three and four is complete. Crew is on the International Space Station is ready for uh, docking. Station Houston, Big Loop, we copied the review of three and four complete. International Space Station ready, thank you. Expedition 63 Commander Chris Cassidy giving the report. Station is ready for docking. So uh, pretty pretty wild, too, to see. We're, we're so close that we're getting shadows from the station on Dragon. Wow. Two meters. We are inside the hands-off point, the CHOP, the crew hands-off point, one meter to go. Soft capture complete. Dragon in Soft capture confirmed, stand by for retraction and docking. Dragon SpaceX, we estimate we are about an hour to Dragon Hatch opening. Copy that, Anna. Thanks for uh, those words. It just helps us uh, manage getting things done. And it uh, looks like you guys are on board. Uh, welcome aboard, uh, I guess, the integrated uh, space station now, huh? Indeed. Thank you so much. We're excited to be here. Dragon SpaceX, docking sequence is complete. Next Dragon, we copy docking complete. To say that it's been a real honor to be just a small part of this uh, nine year endeavor since the last time the United States spaceship has docked with the International Space Station. We have to congratulate the men and women of SpaceX at Hawthorne, McGregor, and at Kennedy Space Center. Their incredible efforts over the last several years to make this possible cannot go overstated. I'd also like to thank Kathy Leaders and her team of the Commercial Crew Program of NASA. An outstanding job by everyone. Last, I'd like to thank the, the men and women of the National Aeronautics and Space Agency. This is an incredible time to be at NASA. Three new vehicles to be flown, continuing mission in low Earth orbit, and then to the moon and Mars. We thank you again and congratulate you. Dragon arriving. Crew of Expedition 63 is honored to welcome uh, Dragon and the Commercial Crew Program to uh, welcome aboard the International Space Station. Bob and Doug, glad to have you as part of the crew. Well done. Bravo Zulu. Okay, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Endeavor, this is Houston. 
Bob and Doug, welcome to the International Space Station after your spectacular rendezvous and docking of the first Crew Dragon vehicle. For the first time since the retirement of the space shuttle, you have completed a historic ride to the ISS and have opened up a new chapter in human space exploration. On behalf of the flight control teams here in Houston and in Hawthorne, California, and to our SpaceX colleagues, bravo on a magnificent moment in spaceflight history and on the start of a new journey that has changed the face of space travel in this new area of space transportation. Bob and Doug, good luck, and we look forward to working with you on board. Dragon SpaceX, Bob and, Doug. Bob and Doug, we here at SpaceX are honored to have been part of ushering in this new era of human spaceflight. On behalf of the SpaceX and NASA partnership, congratulations on a phenomenal accomplishment and welcome to the International Space Station. Well, thank you, Anna. We appreciate uh, all the good words and uh, everyone thanking us, but it truly was a magnificent effort by the entire team, the SpaceX team, the NASA team, and a team across America who was able to pull this off and bring human spaceflight again to our nation. Thanks for everything. Happy to be aboard. And Dragon SpaceX, with that, ground will be enabling hardline power and comm connection shortly. You are go to doff your suits per procedure 4.012. We will be configuring your video to go external shortly, and we have one request for Bob's suit doffing when you're ready to copy. We copy all. Go ahead for Bob's suit. During your approach suit leak check, we noticed Bob's suit pass with a lower PSID than his previous vehicle and ONC checks. We still had plenty of margin to support you in a depress, but in order to rule out potential hardware issues, when Bob is doffing, after he opens his structural zipper, check all three bladder zipper heads to see if any are partially closed. It is possible that if the head is backed off slightly, that the white tooth is partially visible or a small gap can be seen between the end of the zipper head and the gasket end. Please report observations. Copy. Bob will take a close look at his zippers when he doffs, and he'll get doffing first, so uh, we'll let you know as soon as we see something or if we see something. Great. Thank you so much. I don't know about you, Leah, but I will probably be able to watch that tour of Crew Dragon many, many times, <laughs> uh, see seeing it. Dragon, this is SpaceX MD. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> Have a good night. This is Mission Control Houston. If you're tuning in to our coverage, you're getting a live look at the International Space Station Flight Control Room. You're hearing a lot of communications from the International Space Station, both uh, from the space station side over space to ground. Uh, NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy, International Space Station Commander, um, uh, setting up for the hatch opening. You can see a series of cameras scattered around, uh, ready to capture the best views of Bob and Doug coming through that hatch. We did get confirmation just shortly uh, that we did have uh, good uh, pressurization of the vestibule. It'll be about 10 minutes uh, to perform a series of leak checks. Again, that uh, pressure needs to stabilize. The thermal conditions uh, make it swing just a little bit, so just waiting for that to stabilize before those leak checks are finalized. Uh, that underway uh, within the next 10 minutes. SpaceX Dragon uh, with a couple of questions. I am here and ready to copy. 
Hey, Anna. Um, we show about an hour and 11 minutes since we started drying the suits, just to let you know that. And then the uh, other thing is we can put 4.400 uh, Section 2 in work if you think we have some time before uh, we get the hatch open. We copy you are go to stop drying your suits and turn off that suit fan at this time. Let me get you words on that waste system plush. Copy. Uh, we'll shut the uh, suit fan off now. In Dragon SpaceX, we are about a half hour prior to hatch open, so you are go to do that waste system flush if that sounds good to you at this time. Okay, we may give it a few minutes. If it's going to be uh, 30 minutes until hatch opening, we may want to use it just one more time. Uh, so, yeah, we may hold off for another 10 minutes or so. But uh, let us know if anything changes. Otherwise, we'll do it then. Totally reasonable. Sounds like a good plan. This is Mission Control Houston. You're looking at the inside of the International Space Station. What you were hearing before were just some of the uh, audio and video checks, just making sure that everything's synced up so that we get the best views and the best audio possible for when Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley come through that hatch. We're working towards the hatch opening now. You can see uh, Chris Cassidy down the pressurized mating adapter. That hatch uh, will open up to the international docking adapter. On the other side is the Dragon hatch. Cassidy working through those procedures uh, after pressure equalization was complete. Uh, now expecting uh, around the order of 10 to 15 minutes, maybe, until we uh, finally get that hatch open. So we'll stand by, keep those views uh, coming from the inside of the International Space Station to welcome Bob and Doug aboard. Again, 11.37 a.m. Central, the uh, hatch to the international docking that there was open. You see Chris Cassidy there poking his head in. That's the camera at the forward end of the Dragon. Now only one hatch separating Bob Bank and Doug Hurley from Chris Cassidy, who you're seeing here from those Dragon views. Expected time to open that hatch is about 20 minutes from now. We'll report that time to you and expect to do a welcome ceremony at 12.15 a.m. Central Time, 1.15 p.m. Eastern. This is Mission Control Houston. We're continuing to equalize the pressure of that last hatch. Behind that hatch is Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley aboard the Crew Dragon spacecraft. We are moments away from opening the hatch and welcoming, welcoming them aboard the International Space Station. And with that, the hatch is open 12.02 p.m. Central Time, 1.02 p.m. Eastern. Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley open the hatch to the International Space Station after launching from American soil on a U.S. vehicle for the first time in nine years, the first time ever for a commercially built spacecraft.
If you're just tuning in, the hatches are open between Dragon and the International Space Station. International Space Station Commander Chris Cassidy now talking with uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin aboard the Crew Dragon spacecraft. That hatch open at 12.02 p.m. Central, 1.02 p.m. Eastern. We have Bob Bankin from SpaceX Demo 2 mission entering the International Space Station. Followed by Doug Hurley. Station, this is the NASA Administrator. Can you hear me? We hear you loud and clear, sir. Welcome to the Space Station. Thank you, Chris. It's good to see you. And welcome to Bob and Doug. I, uh, I will tell you, the whole world saw this mission, and we are so, so proud of everything you have done for our country and, in fact, to inspire the world. We sure appreciate that, sir. It's uh, obviously been our honor to be just a small part of this. Uh, we have to give credit to SpaceX, the commercial crew program, and of course NASA. It's great to get the United States back in the uh, crewed launch business, and uh, we're just really glad to be on board this uh, magnificent complex. And I just wanted to, to find out if you guys got any sleep on your way up there the last, uh, I'd say, I got 19 hours. Did you guys get any sleep? Yeah, I think a lot of folks in Hawthorne were asking the same question, sir, but uh, we did get probably a good seven hours or so opportunity for sleep, and uh, I did succeed at sleep, and I dug it as well. So uh, the first night is always a little bit of a challenge, but uh, the Dragon was a, a slick vehicle, and uh, we had good airflow, and so we had an excellent, excellent evening and uh, just excited to be back uh, in low Earth orbit again. And, of course, when we go to the moon, it's going to be done um, because of the great people here at the Johnson Space Center and so many other centers across the United States of America. But when we go to the moon, we're going to land on the surface of the moon with commercial landers. Um, and, of course, we're very proud of uh, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program being managed right here out of the Johnson Space Center as well so that we can take small payloads to the surface of the moon. And all of this is leading up to an amazing day uh, where we have humans living and working for long periods of time on the surface of the moon, but doing it with a purpose, and that purpose, of course, is to go to Mars. Gentlemen, congratulations. You know, Jim's mentioned going to the moon, and yesterday and today, one, you've inspired the Artemis generation, which is our next generation, and that's what this is about. It's really bringing the children that we've got and our grandchildren forward so they'll be the ones that are going into deep space. This is the dawn of a new era, and we just thank you for being at the beginning of it. Thank you so much. We're just uh, happy to be here, and uh, Chris is going to put us to work, and uh, hopefully we will fit in and not mess too many things up. Let's start off with a question from Bill Harwood, CBS. Uh, I just want to go back to what Bob was saying yesterday, describing the ride uphill. Uh, you were comparing it a little bit to shuttle. I was more interested in how did the first stage of the Falcon 9 feel compared to the shuttle when it was on solid? How did the second stage feel? Uh, you, you made it sound like maybe it was a little rougher than the shuttle on the main engines. Uh, and just wondering if there was ever a point in there when you looked over at Doug and went, wow, this isn't quite what I was expecting. Well, Bill, you took the words right out of our mouth. The summary from uh, yesterday was good, uh, smoother uh, first stage, a little rougher second stage than we saw on shuttle and that I think both of us were expecting. We did actually comment on it uh, while we were going uphill. I think we tried to verbalize as much of the new experiences we were having just to make sure they were for real between the two of us. We were sensing the same things. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. 
Uh, just to follow up on that, uh, what was the sensation at Nico and at stage separation since that's something that was not experienced really during shuttle to shut down the engines and then ignite a new engine in flight? I'm also curious about how your experiences were with the spacesuits in flight. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the question was uh, about the difference with uh, staging between the space shuttle and the Dragon since we didn't shut down the main engines on the space shuttle uh, like we went through for first stage and second stage. There was a significant difference between the solid rocket boosters on the shuttle and that second stage and so I think we all definitely felt that separation and heard the clunk associated with it. Uh, Doug and I both uh, commented on, I think Doug commented on it first, that uh, we did feel some uh, early zero G when we came off of the first stage and uh, we're getting ready to transition to the uh, second stage and then we felt that uh, second stage uh, light. Hey guys, it's Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. Thanks for taking the time and congrats on your flight and I'll try not to leave you hanging this time. Um, to follow up on Bill and Steven's question about the ride, I wonder if you can walk us through, you know, some of the technological differences between shuttle uh, that led to the difference in the experiences, and then maybe a little bit more of what were some of the key moments during the ascent phase that stood out to you guys. Thank you. Hey, Chris, good to talk with you. Um, I think just generically, the Falcon 9 is a liquid-fueled rocket. Remember, shuttle had solid rocket boosters to start with. Those burned very rough for the first two and a half minutes. The first stage with Falcon 9 were the nine Merlin engines and roughly the same amount of time and it was a much smoother ride obviously because it was a liquid engine uh, ascent at that point. Where the difference started for I think both Bob and I and we commented on it uh, at the moment was at staging and it was very similar to what you saw in the Apollo 13 uh, movie where they staged from first to second stage. So the first stage engine shut off and then it takes a second, almost a second, might, might have been less than that, but it seemed like it took, took some time between the uh, booster separating and then the Merlin vacuum engine starting. And so at that point we go from roughly three Gs to zero Gs for, I don't know, half a second probably. And then when that Merlin vacuum engine fires, then we uh, start accelerating again uh, for the next five, six minutes until we uh, achieve orbit. So totally different than shuttle. Uh, you know, it was smooth. It got a little rougher, as Bob had mentioned before, with the Merlin vacuum engine. And, and, and it'll be interesting to talk to the SpaceX folks to find out why it was a little bit rougher ride on second stage than it was for shuttle on those three main engines. Oh, I'd like to just, uh, uh, yeah, uh, acknowledge the incredible work of the people at SpaceX and, and NASA and everyone in, in uh, creating this technology and in, uh, in what has culminated in this incredible launch today of getting astronauts back to orbit after almost a decade. Um, I think this is something that should really get people, I mean, right on the heart of anyone who is, uh, has any spirit of exploration. And the United States is a distillation of the human spirit of exploration. I think this is something that's particularly important um, in the United States, but appeals to everyone with the, uh, throughout the world who has within them the spirit of exploration. So, um, I mean, I'm really quite overcome uh, with emotion uh, on this day. It's, it's kind of hard to talk, frankly. Um, it's been 18 years working towards this goal, so it's, it's hard to believe that it's happened. Um, and we haven't quite yet docked at the space station, and of course we need to bring them back safely, and we need to repeat this, these missions um, and have this be a regular occurrence. Um, so it's a lot of work to do, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's just incredible. I, I think this is something that everyone, you know, it's, this is a, a craft made by humans, you know, for humans. This is like something that I think humanity should be excited about and proud of occurring on this day. Seeing that group of